Ruiz. Welcome back to the next part of this Truth and Rhythm episode. Be sure to subscribe to this channel. If you've already done so, please share it with friends. Also become a member by joining Truth and Rhythm on Patreon or consider donating at funkinstuff.net. Thank you so much for your interest and support. Enjoy. Were there any points uh, where you were kind of slack jawed at what Sly could do in a studio? You know, between his vocals and what he might do on keys, or maybe he picked up a guitar or whatever he would do. Man, yes, sir. I mean, that dude, man, he was so talented, man. He showed me so much about bass playing and and just uh putting songs together, man. And oh uh, man, he was a hook, you know, his hooks, man, his and, and his lyrical content, man, just all went together, man. He was to me, he was a genius, man. Um it was just mind blowing, Scott. I mean, to to be around that type of uh, talent, man, and and just you know, kind of like being a family and just see it, you know, for what it is and you know for what it was, and uh, just you know, just humbled by it, you know. Uh, uh, it was definitely a a blessing for me, you know. Now that record fresh, um, there are a lot of takes because a lot of takes have actually seen the light at various times. You know, do you remember just like doing a ton of different versions of the tracks? Mm -mm. No, no. I guess that a lot of that stuff came later with uh, whoever owned the masters. They were able to like do some splicing and some editing or whatever. But I don't remember a lot of takes. Um, I'm not sure how that happened. Maybe some things happened after I left. You know, I'm not sure. But uh, after I left, I mean, there was like, you know, heard you miss me while I'm back. And, you know, all those records came out and stuff. So I'm, I'm trying to understand if that was the case. When did that even have time to happen? You know, huh. all those yeah, remixes, all those different tapes. Yeah, because I'm looking at this one that, that actually is a version that came out later, more recently. And they have alternates of, you know, let me have it all, frisky, skin them in keep on dancing babies making babies you know like that and so some of them sound a little more they sound more stripped down than yeah, yeah. somebody probably had uh, got hold of the masters and was able to like you know do some remixing and some editing and like try to reissue it and make a dollar who knows <laughs> imagine that um <laughs> so when this uh hit the streets you know do you remember when you first heard something that you played on on the radio for the first time? Yeah, but it wasn't it wasn't a Sly song. Yeah. <laughs> it was a Johnny Talbot song. And I remember Sly was a disc jockey at KDIA and he was playing like Johnny Talbot songs, you know. Uh that was that was a thrill to hear myself playing bass on the radio, but but yeah, to hear uh hear a Sly song on the radio, man, it's just like and I'm on that. That's me playing, right? It's like, God, leave, man. How did this happen? <laughs> yeah. Did you guys did you guys tour much in support of Fresh? Or did the touring kind of slow down at that point? Fresh, um, yeah, we did a fresh tour. We, you know, we went a lot of places. Um, uh, a lot of Europe stuff, you know. Um, we had a lot of tour dates from Fresh, you know. Um, um Things started going down with, uh, I think, with uh, Small Talk, you know, when that came out. But Fresh Man, we got, you know, Sly got a lot of mileage out of Fresh, still getting mileage out of What Was he, did you uh, sense that Sly was like, hey, you know, check this out, mofos. You know, maybe Larry and Greg are gone and stuff, but I'm still 
the man. Well, if that was his mindset, you know, he didn't like really like put that out there that way. But I mean, I think it was already understood that he was the man. I mean, it's like, you know, Sly was Sly was recording tracks before Greg and Larry, anybody showed up, you know, he was, you know, doing stuff, you know. Yep. For sure. You just and you just look at Woodstock, man. I mean, that tells the whole story right there. <laughs> What uh, well to me it was sort of ironic because I always thought it was ironic, and this was before you know, of course, I met you. But I thought, wow, you know, after Larry Graham is considered like maybe the most innovative bass player ever, maybe people argue him or Bootsy and people like that. Um, he's gone, and then Fresh is possibly, arguably, the funkiest album Sly ever did. Yeah, yeah, that's that's, that's really amazing, man. Um... You know, they, uh, uh, Pete Critton and Freeman uh, and uh, Greg Artis uh, organized this uh, Sly convention in Oakland. I think it was back in 2006. And uh, Sly showed up and everything. And uh, uh, that, that, that whole thing, man, was just uh, incredible for just for the simple fact that Sly showed up after all of these years, you know, and he was very gracious. They had a panel, they were able to ask him questions. And uh, I sat on a panel with a little sister and, you know, Fresh, man, was, Fresh was the topic of discussion and other things, you know, but Fresh, man, was just still, I mean, you can put on any track right now, man, and just get a great feeling listening to it. It's a milestone. Even George Clinton, I think, has said, you know, that that just changed the game, that whatever could be said through funk, basically, was accomplished with Fresh, I think, is basically what George Clinton has said. Oh, what a compliment. Yes, sir. Absolutely, man. So I got, you know, small talk here also, uh, which uh, definitely was a little mellower than Fresh and had things like strings added and uh, you know, Sly was in love, I guess, and had that big marriage at Madison Square Garden and uh, had a uh, son and all that. So things were definitely changing in the life of Sly Stone. It's reflected in this record. Um, right. But there's still moments of, you know, great funk. I mean, when I first heard Loose Booty, it blew my mind, you know, it's like, right. wow. I said, <laughs> I, don't know, I, don't, I don't know what he's saying, but man, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's really something. And you're right. You know, he got married and you know, things were mellowing out and then he went into experimental mode again and started using strings and uh, really getting uh, personal with uh, what he was saying, you know, uh, talking about family and mother beautiful and, you know, small talk with his son. And uh, I guess he was trying to like, trying to settle down, <laughs> you know, uh, it worked for a while. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it worked for a while. Were you at that uh, wedding in the Madison Square Garden? Was I, man? That was <laughs> that was the most incredible thing, at, man, ever, man. I mean, can you imagine? Uh, have you ever been to Madison Square Garden? Only on the outside. Okay, well, to get to the stage level or something, I don't know. It's like, and, and you know, you're driving in. You got to circle up all these cars, get to circle up and get to the level to let us out of the cars, right? And there was like 17 limos, man, circling around, going up to the top of this metal square going to let us out, right? And <laughs> I mean, it was just amazing, man. They had they had the Ebony Fair fashion fair models there and just all of this stuff, man. Halston did the outfits, I mean, Somebody broke down the cost of that wedding, man. I can't remember. It was, it was in the millions, man. And, uh, and, but Sly still played good. I mean, you know, the concert after the ceremony was still funky and fun, man. You know, I had a great time, man. Never forget that. Wow. It was that 74? I believe so. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That, was, that was one for the ages, for sure. <laughs> man. I mean, who, like, sells out Madison Square Garden at his own wedding in plays, right? I mean, you had to be huge to do that. And he really seemed to like that venue. Uh, yeah. Yeah. He, 
Yeah, yeah the whole right. New York, the whole New York vibe, man. So I really liked, you know. Um, he used to call it home away from home because before he moved to LA, you know, in the Bay Area, San Francisco, he had an apartment set up for him in uh, New York. That's where I, I met Miles Davis uh, at Columbia Studios in New York. Uh, you know, Miles like really admired Sly and he would come to our sessions and, you know, hang out and stuff, you know. Hmm. Yeah, he, you know, Sly really liked the New York vibe. I got to mention that small talk also better uh, V than me. Just a great track for me, you know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's a better it happens to you than it happens to me. It's funny. Uh, that title came from uh, this guy named Tommy, who was friends of uh, um, Sly's cousin, Junior. I can't remember Junior's real name, but they, you know, they would hang out together and Anytime something negative would happen or something, Tommy would always say, better than V than me. And Sly heard him say that and made a song out of it. And it was like, hey, go funky, man. I mean, golly. <laughs> he said, better be than me if you're in bad weather, right? Better be than me if you're a heavy feather. Better stop your pouting if your strength is working. Better change your route if the trail is jerking. <laughs> Amazing cat, that dude's amazing. So, did he usually lay down his vocals while you were around too? No, no, he usually did. I mean, I, I've I've heard him do vocals before, you know, uh, but that's pretty much after all the tracks were laid, and he'd be in the control room, you know, uh, doing his vocals. You know, I've I've been to, to a few vocal sessions, but for the most part. Uh, He's kind of like private about. He was kind of private about that, unless Rose and Freddie were with him, you know. And this uh, this particular version has an um, early version of Crossword Puzzle on it that was on High on You. Okay. Um, yeah, you know, it's funny because like the, the original tracks, some of those original tracks. Um, Sly would like listen to him and say, okay, I'm gonna change this, I'm gonna change that, right? Uh, and make them more intricate, make them more um, syncopated, you know, do little things to them to enhance them. And, and he would, he, those songs were always, you know, evolving and uh, morphing into something else, you know? And so those original tracks, uh, someone got a hold of those original tracks before they got, you know, elaborated upon, you know what I'm saying? How, how much would Sly seek input creatively or musically from other band members? Very little, if at all. I mean, everybody, you know, knew that he was the songwriter, man. And Freddie, Freddie, uh, Freddie would get, would be allowed some input here and there. As a matter of fact, uh, he was the one that really put Organized together um, on the uh, High On You album. And uh, uh, yeah, uh, Sly let Freddie do that, right? But you know, it's a very rare occasion that anyone be, would be able to actually write a song and record it or come up with, man, I think you ought to do this and you ought to do that. No, Sly already had an orchestra in his head and he knew just exactly what he wanted it to sound like. So he didn't need, he didn't need any outside influences to, you know, to change what he was hearing. Did, I mean, did you did did you feel like uh, inclusive of like you know the Stone family or was it sort of like a little like the Stones and then the rest of the guys? I felt inclusive, man. I mean, I was like Sly was very protective of me, man. I mean, it was like I'm the young kid in the band, right? And Jerry Martini, same way, man. They were very protective of me and. Uh, uh, I would hang out with Freddie uh, in between tours, man. And we would like hang out in San Francisco and uh, we'd go to his parents' house uh, and his mother and father, you know, big daddy and stuff was there. It's like, now you got to stay out of trouble now, you know, I'm just talking to us like we were kids, right? You know, and, and I felt like I was part of that family. I think I mentioned that earlier. It's like, I wasn't, I wasn't the bass player. I mean, call Rusty, you know, it's time to go out. It was like, if we weren't out, I was hanging out with Freddie. 
you know, you know, with Sly or you know, whatever. Uh, but I, yeah, I felt I very, I felt very included into that family, that family uh, dynamic. So what was different about the studio process and small talk compared to fresh for you, or was it virtually the same? It was different. Um, small talk was more of uh, individuals playing in, you know, playing individually as opposed to an ensemble in a control room and things like that. It was like, you know, I might be in a control room playing bass or Sly might be in a control room playing guitar or Freddie, but it, I, I don't really remember um, the band as a whole, you know, recording. He would probably record the horns, you know, together. Uh, tracks would already be, be down. And, uh, but, but small talk was like, you know, more of a individualistic type of recording process other than, rather than, you know, uh, uh, ensemble type of uh, recording. So how much longer were you part of that group after small talk? Um, probably close to another year or so. Uh, we did the High on You album and everything and um, things were begin, beginning to get out of hand for me as far as uh, um, substance abuse, you know, and I mean, I wasn't no angel myself, but I did have a boundary and uh, when that bound, when it when it got to that line to that boundary, it was like, man, you know, rest is time for you to go, man, you know, because I did not want to get caught up into none of that, you know. I still respected what got me there. What got me there was playing bass and uh, being a musician, and I didn't want to like abuse that to the point where I might lose it altogether. So. I would say maybe close to another year and then I bailed. And so on high on you, you're just involved in one track or more than that? Yeah, see, so I think I did, I did organize. I'm not sure. I, I might have did something else. I can't remember. But I, I, that, that was pretty much it for me. I always felt like that record was overlooked. You know, I think High and You is still a pretty strong record. I like um, the title track is really good. Organized is really good. Crossword puzzle is really good. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, uh, High on You um, was kind of like, once again, kind of like better than me. High on You was kind of like uh, borrowed, you might say, <laughs> from a cut we did for Rose Banks when, when Rose left Slide and went to Motown. Uh, we did a High on You, right? You remember that? No. Tell us about it. We did a high on you, same bass lines to everything, right? Uh, but Sly, we did it on the High on You album. And of course, got more notoriety and more marketing and more publicity than we did. You know, we were with Motown, but, but they were trying to push Rose as a uh, kind of like a I don't want to say Diana Ross, more like a, a pop singer, you know, singing these kind of like doo-wop type of songs and everything. I don't know. It, it was strange. She, uh, they released a single that uh, I think Kim Weston or somebody did called Darling Baby, right? And it was like a doo-wop type of thing. But, um, but we did High on You first. At least the concept of High on You uh, was on a Rose Banks album. And then next thing you know, uh, Sly had it on on his records. I think I heard it subsequently, and I and I assumed, I guess, that it was the other order, you know. But oh, yeah, that's no, really interesting. No, no, no. It was, uh, <laughs> Sly was he was he was he was very uh very good at like hearing something and making something out of it right away. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't Sly for nothing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um. Oh, I gotta ask you about this. Um, around the time when you were with Sly, I believe, 
um, my mom and I, because I was like 12 or something at the time, we went to a, a TV taping in Hollywood that had Sly and the Family Stone, Al Green, um, and uh, you know Sly performed a couple songs at the end of it. And when it was over, he went through the audience and he, he was wearing that black outfit that he had with like the rhinestones and everything. And he actually brushed right up against me as he left. He was all sweaty and um, left wow. quite an impression on me. And I can't find any information on that show anywhere. And I just was it Don, was it Don Kirshner rock concert or a midnight special or something? I, don't, I remember. Well, Al Green was on it, you said? Al Green was part of it. Yeah, there was like maybe, you know, five acts or something like that. And those are the two I remember. Out green and sly. Well, I tell you, I, I can I can tell you who can find out for you. B. Crittenden Freeman. <laughs> He'll find out for you. Trust me, they got that sly and family stone page and the whole thing. And he'll he, you know contact him and he'll let you know. <laughs> All right. Well, that's the only time I ever got to see Sly and the Family Stone. So oh wow. Yeah. You know, seen Larry Graham several times. But um so when you went on your own, actually was around I guess maybe a year after Larry went and did Graham Central Station and all that. Did you keep track of Larry Graham at all and what he was doing or or were you guys just kind of on your separate paths? We were on our separate paths, but I was definitely paying attention to everything he was doing, man. That dude came out killing, man. I mean, he, he, um, he continued to uh, influence bass playing tremendously with uh, Graham Central Station and, you know, to have a what a five six piece band, uh, man, he was like they were on fire, man. It was great, and so I was like checking that out for sure, man. He was like one of my main mentors, you know. So. Um, did you do any TV shows with Sly in the Family Stone? Yeah, we did. Um, once again, the Midnight Special. We did uh, in concert. Um, we did uh, Soul Train. We did the Mike Douglas show for a week. Um, we did a few TV shows. Yeah. Was that fun to you or is it just work or what was it like? It was fun, man. Uh, um, I, re I remember, man, I just did a segment on my uh, YouTube channel talking about the uh, the, Don, uh, the Soul Train experience, right? It's on my YouTube channel. And uh it, it was fun, man. See, Sly was one of the first guys. Like you said, he brushed up against you when he left the stage, right? He was one of the first guys, if not the first, to come through the audience and go to the stage and play live on Soul Train. If you think about it, most bands are already in place when Don Cornelius would, you know, announce them. But we came up through the crowd, man. And it was just, it was it was so cool, man. Hmm. So when you left that Motown connection, was that part of what got you on that Temptations record? Yeah, exactly. We were there doing a Rose Banks uh, album and uh, Jeffrey Bowen, who was producing, um, uh, asked me to do a few songs. So, uh, yeah, I was, I was able to do the, do the, uh, the, the Temps thing. Uh, what was that song? Up the Creek Without a Paddle, right? Yeah, I think so. I got it. That bass line, I think, is kind of similar to High on You, too. No, no, it's not. No, it's not. I remember it. It's different. But, uh, yeah, I was able to, you know, be but with the uh, Rosebank and Motown affiliation, I was able to do some Temptation tracks. Yeah, Up the Creek Without a Pedal. Yeah. Um. Was it a kick uh, meeting the temps? I mean, were you in studio with them at all or they did their thing separate? Never saw them. <laughs> Never saw them. Oh, I remember one day uh, riding down Sunset Boulevard. So uh, uh, I came to a signal light and Charlie Wilson and I think Robert Wilson and Dennis Edwards were standing outside talking, right? And so I yelled at him, right? Dennis Edwards was like, hey man, what's going on? We got to do something together, right? And <laughs> And uh, we just pulled off. But that, that's the most I've seen of them. <laughs> <laughs> and how'd you make the Lenny Williams connection? 
Wow, then that now you're really going back. Uh, the Lenny Williams connection. You know, I'm not. I'm not really sure how I met Lenny, but I remember uh, we became very close, and I ended up, you know, sharing an apartment with Lenny uh, in Oakland. This was uh, this was prior to Sly and stuff too. Um, and I remember uh, there's a, a record company called Fantasy Records here in Berkeley, and uh, there was this uh, recording artist. I'm not sure if he was from Haiti or Trinidad. His name was Bola Sete, guitarist, you know, acoustic guitarist. And he did a remake of uh, My Sweet Lord by George Harrison. And Bola Sete wanted Lenny to put some background vocals on the, on the vamp. When he says, hallelujah, Krishna, Krishna, whatever, right? And so Lenny said, Rusty, come with me. So I went with him and I voiced... I gave him the three parts to sing uh, in the vamp on that Bola Sete record. And I think I was I was still like 17, 18 or something. I hadn't went out with Sly yet. And um, uh, when Bola Sete heard the tracks, he was very, very happy with what happened. And me and Lenny became very close. I'm the one that influenced Lenny to go ahead and join Tower Power. Cause it, because he really didn't want to do it. Um, whatever was like, you know, troubling him about doing it. I was like, man, go do that gig, man, and get up out of here, right? And so he did it, and the rest is history. Wow. Yeah, but uh, yeah, man, Lenny, you know, to this day, you know, we have a relationship. Yeah, really enjoy him. He's been on the show. And, um, so it must have been a kick to you when you heard his songs all over the radio and you're like, man, I knew him when and I'm the one that kicked him in the butt to do it. That's right. <laughs> That's right. His first, uh, one of his first records, uh, uh, Rise, Sleep and Beauty. Uh, myself, David Stallings, the guitar player that I mentioned earlier, and Willie Wild Sparks' brother, Ted Sparks, was playing drums. He went on to play drums for Natalie Cole. Anyway, we cut Lenny's first album, Chester Thompson, the, the uh, organist with Tower Power uh, in Santana, he produced. And that song, Cause I Love You, that really just hit for Lenny. The original version of that is on the Rise Sleeping Beauty record, the original version. They recut it and they kind of like toned it down, especially my part, because I was going kind of nutty at the vamp, right? <laughs> and Chester was digging it, but I, I, it, was, it was too much. So so they recut it, but yeah. Wow, that's some great history right there. Um, yeah, like we we're talking about the Bay Area. I mean, before we, I didn't even mention Tower of Power, but just another all-time great band, and it's still doing it too. Um. Yeah, I used to get to I used to get to see all that stuff, man. I remember Tower Power was doing a concert at Skyline High School one night, uh, and me and Willie and David, we were like, you know, the three musketeers. We go see everybody, man. And I remember they were in a gym, and uh, Willie Fulton was playing guitar at the time. This was before Bruce Conti and before a lot of people, right? Uh, Francis Rocco Christian was was there, and Garibaldi was there. All the horn players were there, but you know, I got to see them pre success uh, Tower of Power, the pre success Tower of Power, when they were like, you know, just playing, trying to make it and just loving what they were doing. I got to see all of that, man. Yeah, wow. So you also, um, your credits show George Clinton. What, what have you done with George Clinton? I, um, Besides, this, uh, <laughs> this is a funny story with, uh, I, you know, when I did that first record with Robin Trower um, in City Dreams, we recorded at the Criteria Studios in, in um, Hialeah or Miami, one of the two. And, uh, uh, and I'm in Oakland, right? So I get all the way back to Oakland and then I get a call, Russ, you got to come back and fix something, right? And so I fly all the way back to uh, Florida to fix like less than one bar of something. I mean, it's a couple, it's crazy, right? It's like, and so I'm flying back to Barry and George Clinton's on the plane. So we sitting there, we're chopping it up. 
fast forward to like 2002, 2003, there's uh, this new uh, fledgling record company called Off Planet Studios in San Francisco uh, trying to establish itself. And George Clinton is in there and some other people are in there. And so I start, so I put this track together and uh, I said, George, man, would you do something on this? He said, yeah. So uh, re-rocking of a rock stars, what that is. And uh, Levi Caesar, the guitarist with uh, Prince on the, um, on the Sign of the Times tour, remixed it, man. And George don't even know, but that song is slamming, dude. It's called re-rocking of a rock star. <laughs> The original version, man, he, in a vamp, he ends up talking about Fred Flintstone and, you know, Barney Rubble and just anything that has something to do with a rock, you know, very clever, very clever. Yeah, you give him any theme, he'll just take it off in all kinds of directions. Man, he'll write hook upon hook. Is that available? Uh, Re-Rocking is on the remix of... Uh, uh, Rusty Allen Simple Rules CD. We haven't re-released re it yet. Uh, we did the D.D. Simon thing, but uh, it'll be available soon. Cool. And then, you know, I want to mention too, because you mentioned Robin Trower and you did a lot of stuff with him. Um, and for funk fans who don't know, amazing guitar player. Man, I, man, I'm telling you, I might have like, it might have been a Freudian slip or something, but we were doing this uh, um, question and answer panel thing in Japan, and they asked me, what did I think of Robin Trower? And I said, man, I, you know, I always wanted to play with Jimi Hendrix, but Robin Trower is the next best thing, right? And I don't know if that rubbed him the right way, but man, it was, I mean, to be like, in my head, to be even compared to somebody like Jimi, man, it's like, speaks volumes about you you know and man some of those gigs with robin char dude man that cat man just amazing man just man he was just like a roaring lion man you know just like I had great great gigs with him me and and you know bill lorden had left sly and went to robin trower and bill lorden was responsible for getting me the audition with robin so have yeah, some great gigs man yeah, and you did a Listen few, to, few albums, right? Yeah, we did In City Dreams. I did Caravan at Midnight. And uh, listen to uh, listen to uh, Robin Char Live, King Biscuit Flower Power Hour uh, from New Haven, Connecticut. I think it's 76 or 77. That album is smoking, man, from the first song to the last. I'm not bragging or nothing. I'm just saying Robin is on fire. And... Me and Bill, man, we were like a hand in a glove, man. It was crazy. Our chemistry just, it just happened that way, you know. Who knows? Who can explain it? How many pieces were in that group? Just three. Bass, drum, guitar, and yeah. Jimmy Dewey was singing, yeah. Yeah, so there's a little bit of the Hendrix flavor in that alone, you know. Yep, yep. So that must have been liberating for you, playing in a trio format and getting to do that after, you know, the types of things you were doing before that. Yeah, it, it was definitely fun, man. Um, I had a great time doing the Robin Trower thing. Um, being totally into being a bass player and not really uh, focusing on business kind of left... Uh, a bad taste in my mouth as far as the Robin Char thing uh, wasn't Robin's fault, you know, management, you know, when they have somebody and they see that, oh, this guy's not thinking about his own accountants. He's not thinking about his own uh, attorneys or nothing like that. I think we got one, you know, and on the level of, of on the level that Robin and them were doing things, I mean, they were shipping gold before, you know, the record was even released, you know, so a lot of money exchanged hands, but uh, you live and you learn. Mm. yes i hate to hear that I hear that way too often um so what did you uh where did life take you after you know the heavy robin trower stuff um i ended up uh just kind of like doing gigs around town and you know um uh, doing recording sessions around town you know i was able to survive as a bassist you know 
I finally had been forced to take a couple of jobs, but you know, they were like in music stores and things like that. So, but I ended up with a band um, by the name of Second Wind. And this is like around 1979, 1980. And uh, that band, man, was the next one to get out of the Bay Area. Um, Bernard Edwards from Chic came and saw us perform in a club in Oakland. And uh, the next thing we knew, we were recording at the power station in New York. Steve Ferroni was doing our drum tracks for us from uh, Average White Band. Bonnie Boyer was singing lead, uh, who ended up going with Prince when we disbanded. But yeah, that band, Second Wind, um, was on the way. Atlantic Records uh, was ready to sign us, but uh, our manager uh, really didn't know what to ask for. He asked for too much, too quick. And they just, they just say, well, thanks, but no thanks. So, you know, just, you know, life just goes on. I'm just like playing bass, man. I'm like, right now, I'm a student at uh, Delta College here in Stockton. I've been um, a student at Delta College for the last couple of years, taking theory. I've been playing uh, upright bass in a symphonic band in a symphonic setting, uh, playing with the jazz combos and the jazz orchestra and uh, doing gigs around town. Um, playing with this uh, uh, Prince tribute band called the Purple Ones, which is really decent. Levi Caesar, who was once again, the guitarist with Prince, he's MDing and uh, it's a lot of fun, you know, uh, been able to maintain and everything's, everything's good, man. Scott, I'm still here. Hey, well, thank goodness for that, you know? Um, and it's to your credit that you're going back and trying to, you know, educate yourself more. That's fantastic. They never quit learning, man. I was on a panel with Victor Wooten and uh, um, uh, can't remember that. Steve, Steve, I can't remember this is his last name, bass player that's always hanging with Victor Wooten. Anyway, Steve, uh, Chuck Rainey was on the panel, Dennis Chambers, everything. We were talking about uh, different things and uh, Victor was asking me questions and uh, played, he played my first single that I ever really cut, you know, and uh, and I told them I was like studying uh, classical bass, you know, and uh, they were like, what type of bow are you using? Are you using a French or a German bow? And I was like, French bow. And they was like, oh, no. <laughs> you know? But uh, yeah, I, I, I just don't understand how one could stop trying to yearn to learn. You know, it's like, it don't stop. It just doesn't stop man, until your heart stops. Well, it's like over, it's over. It, yeah, especially for if you're a musician, you never retire, right? You can always keep playing. Oh, yeah, you can keep playing, man. That's, that's one of the things I've had just read, you know, uh, we may not be able to jump as high and run as far and lift as much weight as we used to, but we can still play. So that's a blessing. What, what were your subsequent relationships like with, um, you know, Sly and Freddie and uh, other people from the group, Larry? Um, like I said, man, I was like family, you know, um, uh, man, Freddie, man, we, we were thick as thieves, man. We were like, you know, hang out, man, go hear people play. Do you know, man, um, uh, the way I met Bobby Womack is that, um, uh, me and Freddie were in LA, um, hanging out and Bobby Womack was playing at Griffith Park or uh, Griffin Park or something like that, out, uh, nighttime out door venue right and so Freddie's like let's go see Bobby let's go see Bobby so I said okay so we go, we drive there we get in you know Freddie Stone so they're gonna let Freddie in you know and we get in next thing you know next thing I know I'm standing in the wings on stage right next thing I know I got a bass in my hand and 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 I'm playing I'm like how did this happen but that's how I met Bobby on a on a gig on the stage right and uh, it was it was funny, man. But uh, I ended up uh, playing for Bobby too. Wow! Do you have any idea about what year that first happened? That connection it had to be somewhere in the seventies. I'm not sure. Oh, uh, so you knew him for a good 70s. long while. Yeah. What's your perspective of of Sly and the Family Stones' influence and the recordings you did with Sly 
on uh, people like the Ohio players who we talked about, Isley Brothers, Prince, you know, how do you see that influence and legacy through them? Well, you can hear it in the music, man. I mean, uh, uh, when Prince plays bass, um, you can just hear, you know, little inflections and influences of Sly's bass playing. Um, uh, you listen to musicology, Prince does a roll call of all of those people, man, you know. Um, Sly uh, influenced Ohio players. Sly influenced everybody, man. I mean, the Temptations, man. I mean, uh, they even ended up having to say boom, 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 boom. They even had to do it, you know, because <laughs> everybody loved it. And, uh, but yeah, you you know, in Prince's music and Ohio players, all of them, man, all of them. Earth, Wind, and Fire, all of them, man, had, you know, had been influenced by Sly's innovative musical mind, man, I mean, without a doubt. If you could distill it down to one or two things, what do you think was Sly's greatest talent? Songwriting. Um, playing music. You know, playing all the instruments. And uh, to me, just being a nice dude, man. Just loving me like a nice dude. It's funny. You know, well. He has such a notorious reputation. A lot of that maybe is related to substances. But, um, you know, from the people I talk to that have worked with him, I've talked to a lot of them. I mean, they speak so well of Sly, you know. Well, you know, I was able to, like, break through that Sly Stone. Um, I don't want to say just just that whole fence, that whole wall thing, you know, of Sly Stone. All I had to do was say Sylvester. And when I called him that, that, I think that triggered something in him that humbled him enough for him to forget about the fact that I'm Sly Stone, I'm Sylvester Stewart. I remember one time he even said, man, I like to, you know, I, you know, me and him and Freddie were in a hotel and I, I said, Sylvester, so and so and so. And Sly said, Freddie, man, I like the way he says my name. <laughs> but yeah, but I mean, but when I call him Sylvester, that kind of like made him reel himself in, so to speak, you know what I mean? Brought him, you know, to a to a different reality, you know. I don't know, mm. but uh, yeah, but but man, that guy, those three things, man, just being a nice person, man, being a great songwriter, and being a great musician, man, it's like what I'll remember. So, Rusty, I know you put out that um, Simple Rules EP in 2019, I think it was, um, and you mentioned some of that music, and you have the new song. Uh, have you done anything else on your own besides um, that and the new track? No, not not recently. I uh, like I said, I've been like really focusing on uh, uh, going to school and you know trying to uh, keep some semblance of uh, uh, musical skill intact. Um, trying to understand uh, better uh, music and theory and things like that. Uh, uh, I hope to cut some new music. Um, I've been talking to Levi and, you know, it's just a matter of just going over there and just starting to write, you know, but uh, right now my passion right now is like into like trying to stay, uh, remain competent as a bass player. Well, what inspired that new song and, uh, and who is Dee Dee Simon? Dee Dee Simon is like this um, amazing uh, singer, man. Um, uh, I've been hearing about her for a while, and I'm, I'm sure she's huge down south. But um, um, she was she was gracious enough to uh, to uh, come sing on that track. Now the lyrics uh, in the hook were written by me and Laura Cooks. Laura Cook is Cynthia Robinson's daughter, and she wrote the lyrics, and I wrote the hook, and. Uh, Dee Dee Simon came in and re redid the lead vocal and just did what she did, man. And 
I'm so happy with it. And uh, hopefully, you know, it'll create uh, an avenue by which I can do some gigs, you know? Yeah. When was the last time you actually played out somewhere? Last Saturday. Okay. With the purple ones. <laughs> Got to play go. tomorrow with the purple ones. I've been gigging like a lot with them lately and uh, been turning gigs down because, you know, it's like, man, it's getting harder to like do all of these gigs, man, and to go to school and stuff. And then I play in church on Sundays. So uh, I'm, my plate is pretty, very full. Then I work out three or four days a week, you know, uh, religiously, you know, and uh, so I'm pretty busy, man, you know, for an old guy. <laughs> <laughs> what was your favorite Prince track to play? I don't man, I love them all, man. Lady Cab Driver, I really like Let's Work. You mm -hmm. know, I like Yeah. There's a song we do uh called uh that's playing the sunshine. And that's not an easy song to play because the tempo is up and, and and Prince did a lot of stuff on bass, man. It's like but um, I mean, there's a lot of Prince music that I'm not aware of, but man, all of it that I am aware of, man, it's just from the get go, man. It's just like this dude's something else right here. Yeah. Is there anybody that you just uh, was like your dream person to maybe play with? Who might that be? Jimi Hendrix. Yeah. Jimi Hendrix, man. It was like, like I said, you know, that story I told you about being up in the nosebleed section when he was down on the floor. I, man, I, I kicked myself in the butt to this day because I should have went down there and went right to the stage and got right up under, you know, by his feet and looked up at him and got his attention and went like, <laughs> you know, I want to play bass for you. And you plus, can... you know, I kind of like looked like him too. It would have been a great gimmick. <laughs> at the time, man, I had these big locks and had my headband on and everything. And it's like, Man, but man, I just love that dude's music, man. Man, he's like, I, you know, when I go to the gym, I, I like to ride a stationary bike for like eight or nine miles, right? And I'll play the, I'll play the Cry of Love album. I'll listen to the whole album, right, while I'm riding. And I'm a band of gypsies, man. Fillmore West, man. I'm just still into that, and it's still fresh to me. So yeah, Hendrix would be the one. Oh yeah, well, band of gypsies. You could have, you know, we might not have ever known Billy Cox. Right, right. Well, <laughs> Billy Cox, man, I'm telling you, <laughs> man, when I heard Band of Gypsies, man, I was like, man, when I heard Who Knows, I was like, man, this is like, and he had the right guy on bass, Billy Cox, man, he had the right guy. Well, you I'm know? saying if you had gone up and said, I want to be your bass player at that show, you know. Yeah, yeah, you wouldn't have known about Billy Cox. That's true, because I definitely would have been doing that game. <laughs> <gig. laughs> I would have had that one. So how, how can uh, viewers and listeners, you know, uh, get your new song and keep up with what you're doing? Well, there's uh, my website, uh, RustyAllen.com. Then there's uh, my YouTube channel, uh, Rusty Allen YouTube show, Virtual Fan Club. Um, you can send me emails. You can email my uh, manager, B. Crittenden Freeman at bcfreeman02 at gmail.com. Um, and... Just, you know, check me out on Facebook, whatever. You, you'll find me. What what inspired you to do those YouTube shows? My manager, he, uh, he told me, uh, Russ, man, we got to, like, do some marketing. Uh, and let's, let's try to uh, create this fan club. So we started recording these segments. And uh, so far, it's been good. People have been enjoying it. You know, I've been getting some views in some minutes. And. We'll continue, man. I got a whole lot of segments to record, man. I mean, I got like, like, you know, temps and trower and all kind of stuff to talk about. So, yeah, but uh, uh, Freeman was the one that inspired me to go ahead and do it. So we're doing it. Yeah, I've seen some of them. So you, you seem to feel pretty comfortable, you know, just talking into the camera. So that's good. Yeah, yes, it's, it's fun. I mean, it's like with Levi there, it's like, you know, uh, you know, we played in the same band together, so it's like, you know, we're just buddies talking, you know. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. Um, last question I got for you is, um, if you can only have five albums, Rusty, what would they be? And, and they can't be any that you're on. Other people. Um, 
It would be Live Evil by Miles Davis. Uh, Imaginary Voyage by John Lou Pani. Uh, but Not For Me by Ahmad Jamal. Um, said I couldn't be on any of them, right? Yeah, other people. Uh, uh, John Lee Hooker, man, uh, anything that he did. <laughs> and uh, Albert King, man, I'll play the blues for you. Any of those records would be the ones. All jazz and blues, man. Yeah. All of them. Three jazz, two blues. Hmm. Yeah, it's like, um, to me, man, you know, blues and jazz, man, is what, you know, where the punk comes from, man. It's like, you know, it's just like, it's just like uh, dissected more, you know, and syncopated more. But, I mean, Miles understood that. That's why, you know, when he came out with Live Evil, man, he knew. He knew, man, he was listening to Sly and stuff. He knew about it. Put that jazz stuff on top of that funk, man. And yeah, this works. What, what's your favorite Sly song of all, of all time? My favorite song? Sly track of all time. Uh, I'm trying to think of the name of it. Um, Frisky. Frisky. Why do you like that one so much? It's the way it builds, man. It just like uh, the, the chord progression. Uh, it just, just how it just, how the song just develops as it moves through the, you know, through time and everything. But by, by the time it gets to the vamp, man, it's just like, all in your face, man, you know. Risky. Did you ever get tired of playing like all the old hits he had, like Dance to the Music and Everyday People and that kind of stuff? Or were you cool with that? Now, as long as Andy Newmark was on the gig, never. Man, Andy Newmark, man, just, you know, lit fire into everybody, man. And uh, it never got old, man, it just never did. I'm like, man, this is gonna last forever, dude. Man, I'm just, you know, man, just shoot. Wow, man. But yeah, no, it, it never got old, Scott. I mean, I mean, if I could do it now, man, I'd do it. But it had to be with the right catch, though. Yeah. You know, you know, uh, Jerry Martini and Cynthia, they had a group called the Family Stone Experience uh, that I played with for a while, and. Uh, uh, Billy Johnson, this drummer from the Bay Area, played drums. Uh, Thomas Cryer played keys. Um, Charles Spike, Charlie Spikes played guitar. I played bass. Uh, um, Ty Austin, she sang like Rose's parts, and Cynthia and Jerry, and then Fred Ross did all the Sly's parts. But man, that was like the closest thing to a cover band sounding like Sly and doing it right that I've ever heard. Not just cause I was in it, but I mean, the, the players, man, they understood, man. Um, but yeah, man, um, it doesn't get old, man. Hmm. And I feel like you don't either, man. You still look good and you're still, you know, out there doing it, which is fantastic and power I to you, man. I hope you keep on keeping on with that. Yes, sir. Absolutely. It's my lifestyle now, Scott. If it ain't spiritual, if it ain't physical, if it ain't musical, if it ain't like loving, if it's not, you know, productive, I ain't about it. I ain't in it. <laughs> you know, I, I that's all I got time for. You know what I mean? And time is running out. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, <laughs> Perhaps the biggest question, the most pressing question is making sure that the spelling of your first name is correct, because I've seen it T-Y and I've seen it T-double E, and I believe it's the E spelling, right? T-double E, Sly did that. He said, you're not rusty, you're going to be Russ T, <laughs> right? Like David T. Walker, you're going to be Russ T, and he, and he changed my name. <laughs> 
Okay. So we, your birth name though is with the Y. No. No. Yeah, I mean, actually my birth name is yeah, with a Y. Yeah. Yeah. And he changed it to two E's. Okay. That's why. That makes sense. All right. Hey man, thank you so much for sharing all this with us, Rusty. And thank you for the incredible music that's meant so much to, you know, not just my life, but so many viewers and listeners and millions of people around the world. So bless you, man. Thank you very much. Appreciate it, Scott. Thanks for having me. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Truth and Rhythm. A big thank you goes out to our guest as well as to you, the viewer and listener. Also much gratitude to pleasure for supplying the show's funky opening and closing music. As a reminder, you can always access the complete list of linked shows by episode at funkinstuff.net. I urge you to support this program and receive the extra benefits along with that by subscribing to the Funk and Stuff channel on YouTube and sharing it with funk, R&B, and jazz lovers, joining Truth and Rhythm's membership program at Patreon, submitting a donation at funkinstuff.net, buying Everything is on the One, the first guide to funk book at Amazon, shopping at the Funky Things store for cool merchandise at funkinstuff.net, and linking through funkinstuff.net for all of your Amazon purchases. In addition, if you're an artist or anyone seeking proven, results-oriented, professional marketing, PR, writing, or editing consultation or production, check out the media services section at funkinstuff.net. Also, I encourage you to drop me a line at scottg at funkinstuff.net. I love the feedback, suggestions, guest requests, appearance and sponsorship inquiries, and just talking about my favorite subject, groove-based music. For now, and as always, this is Scott Dr. GX Wolfine saying, keep on keep vibing on to the rhythm of the one.